Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Spencer and I'm a research assistant for the Polis Water Sustainability Project, which is based at the University of Victoria. And our communications director, Laura Brandes, who's typically in my spot, is the host of our webinars. Uh, but of course, she's joining us today as a presenter. And I look forward to hearing her contributions and in this capacity, as well as Dan Fumano, who's going to be providing some color commentary for us today. Uh, Dan needs to leave today's discussion at about 10 a.m. Uh, we thank him for making the time, but he's got a busy schedule as a reporter. Uh, so we move on to today's webinar. It's Make Some Noise, Media Engagement, and Water Law Reform. The final webinar in our 2014-2015 Creating a Blue Dialogue webinar series, which is the end of our fifth season. And our next season will resume after the summer, so stay tuned for details on that. And I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I know some of you have attended our webinars in the past, uh, but for those of you who haven't, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about what the Creating a Blue Dialogue series is about. So its goal is to bring together water leaders and practitioners in one virtual space to engage with emerging and priority issues in water policy and water governance. And today's webinar, as I hope you all know, will explore the importance of public participation in media engagement, particularly when it comes to influencing water policy and law reform. The speakers will also offer some tangible tools to increase your chances of being heard in the media landscape. And uh, this webinar is intended to build on our September 2014 webinar, A Blueprint for Watershed Governance in British Columbia which focused on nine winning conditions needed to move towards a more sophisticated approach to watershed governance in BC. And we couldn't carry out this series without the support of our various partners. All of them are listed here on this slide. I want to say a big thank you to all of them, in particular Canadian Water Network, as they're our core supporter for this year's series and for the past few years as well. Uh, as well as to Water Canada Magazine, who is our media sponsor. And today's webinar will be complemented by a skills building session, which is being hosted by Canadian Freshwater Alliance on July 28th. I have the details there on the slide. And this is intended for nonprofit and First Nations groups. And the webinar takes a first look at the CFA's brand new How to Talk About BC's Water Sustainability Act toolkit which is intended for BC's grassroots community, and we'll share some common framing on key WSA regulation areas that you can use as part of your work as freshwater stewards. And registration information for this webinar can be found under the event section of CFA's website. And I have the link on the slide there. So before I hand things over to the speakers, there's just a few housekeeping items I'd like to run through with you. So the first has to do with audio. Uh, as I'm sure you've all realized, I have a blanket mute on everyone. Since we're expecting so many listeners, this means we won't have any audio feedback chaos to distract us from the presentation, uh, which might raise the question, well, how do we deal with questions? I see many of you are using the, uh, the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen. So after both Laura and Dan are finished presenting, that's where we'll handle the questions. And I'll serve as the moderator and read them out as they come in, and Laura and Dan will be able to answer them. And the final housekeeping item I'd like to share with you is that uh, now is a nice opportunity for you to introduce yourself in the chat box, perhaps give a weather update from your region. Just a nice way to get a sense of the community in the room, since we're all scattered across the country. It's nice to get to know who's in that virtual space. Uh, so if you could say who you are, what organization you're with, and how many folks are listening with you, that should help us feel a bit more like a community. So on to today's speakers. First up will be Laura Brandis. Laura is the Communications Director for the Polis Water Sustainability Project, bringing with her expertise as a writer, editor, and science communicator her work focuses on disseminating new policy research and effectively engaging communities, governments, and practitioners on water conservation and policy issues. Laura completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph, studying wildlife biology and musicology, 
and she is an alumna of the BAMP Center's Science Communications Program. And our second speaker today is Dan Fumano, who I said will be providing his expert insight and some commentary throughout the session. Uh, Dan is a reporter at the Province Daily Newspaper based in Vancouver, where he covers a range of topics including the environment, crime, and politics. In 2013, he began a series of stories about water issues in BC, for which he won a Jack Webster Award in 2014 for BC's Best Science, Technology, Health, and Environment Reporting. Dan completed a Bachelor of Arts at the University of BC and a Master of Journalism at Ryerson University in Toronto. And so with that introduction to our webinar and to the speakers, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Laura. So Laura, I think you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, thank, you so thank you so much, Megan. Um, before I get started, um, Dan, can we just make sure that you're unmuted? I think you may need to press star six on your phone. Um, Dan and I are going to kind of tag team the presentation today um, with him offering some color commentary, as Megan said. So before I, I dive in, I want to make sure I have my second ready. Hmm. So if you're able to, Dan, you just need to press star six on your phone and that should unmute you. Okay, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay. So once again, thank you, Megan. And I also want to give a big thank you to Dan for being here today. As Megan said, he's going to need to sort of skedaddle out of here shortly after 10. Um, he and I were joking yesterday. It's such a real life example of working with the chaotic schedule of, of a media person. So uh, yeah, we're yeah, getting the, real, the, real world experience. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my apologies to everyone. This is it's supposed to be my day off. And then at the last minute yesterday afternoon, something came up and I had to Come in right after. So yeah, as Laura says, it's a bit of a real life example of how sometimes in the media our schedules we can't really control them. So thanks for understanding. Yeah, and thanks for being here. So we'll just dive in. The, the goal of today's session is to really empower those of you on the call to better engage with media regarding priority environmental issues. And these are those critical and sometimes overlooked stories that generally require action and really need to be told. Today's session is going to be particularly grounded in British Columbia's Water Sustainability Act process, um, but it will certainly be relevant to those of you who aren't based in BC. Um, and from that initial poll that Megan had up on the screen, um, I know we have folks with various levels of media experience in the room. Um, I think about 62% of you, if my, if my math is correct, had um, little to, to no experience with media, um, which is great. Hopefully you'll really take something away. For those of you who do have a lot of experience, Dan and my hope is that you're all able to take something away, particularly given today's framing of influencing water law reform. So today's talk begins quite a number of years ago in the Agora of Ancient Greece. Um, and this is one of the earliest examples of the public sphere. And the public sphere has been defined as the arena where citizens come together, exchange opinions regarding public affairs, discuss, deliberate, and eventually public opinion is formed. Now this coming together of citizens to discuss and debate current issues has continued throughout history, including in the royal courts of European monarchies and also in the salons of Paris. Now some of these arenas were certainly more exclusive than others, and I would argue that this has actually shifted over time, with the public sphere today being a much more sprawling, open, and noisy place. As media and communications technology have developed, the character of the public sphere has actually changed from a physical location to more of a communications network. So nowadays, the public sphere is strongly tied to media. And this includes traditional media, things like print and broadcast, as well as social media platforms, so things like Twitter, YouTube, blogs. This isn't to say that you know community, me community meetings and those type of physical gatherings are no longer relevant but media certainly dominate public dialogue and debate today. And of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, the media landscape is getting continually more busy, more chaotic, and more noisy with any number of outlets for disseminating your thoughts and stories. 
We really do live in an age of media saturation, and knowing how to navigate this landscape is critical to having your stories heard. So regarding this age of media saturation, uh, in a study that was conducted by a communications researcher at the University of Southern California, he looked at media consumers in the United States between 2008 to 2015, so very recently. And he found that by this year, it's estimated that Americans will consume both traditional and digital media for an average of 15 and a half hours per person per day. This statistic kind of blew my mind when I first heard it. That's a lot of hours. Um, one thing that's important to note is this didn't um, account for, did not adjust for double counting. So, you know, if you're watching, uh, watching the TV and browsing the internet and have your radio on for say an hour, that would count as three hours of media consumption. Interestingly, traditional media still continues to dominate our daily media consumption with TV and radio contributing 60%. Um, but having said that, new digital sources are of course having increasingly major effects on most forms of media consumption. Now given the amount of time that people are spending engaged with media, there's clearly an opportunity to have your stories heard. But as I said, one of the biggest challenges is learning how to effectively engage in this chaotic media landscape. So when it comes to telling your environmental stories, the good news is that media has an established reputation for, first of all, publicizing environmental issues and also for influencing decision making. And these two points have been really well articulated by UK media researcher named Anders Hansen. And he said that since the emergence and rise of the modern environmental movement back in the 60s, the mass media have been a central public arena for publicizing environmental issues and for contesting claims, arguments, and opinions about our use and abuse of the environment. So media is there, it raises awareness, it's been doing this for you know, over half a century. He then goes on to say that decision making has increasingly been influenced and governed by how environmental and related issues are presented to and perceived by the public. So not only is media an awareness raising tool, it actually is an influencing tool. And one really tangible example of media's influence on decision makers was seen just a couple summers ago here in British Columbia when priority water issues received significant media attention in major BC newspapers, radio, and other outlets. So this media buzz back in the summer of 2013, it stemmed from a series of feature stories published in the province, and Dan, you were certainly a catalyst in getting a lot of this kind of rolling, um, and also an op-ed that was authored by policy analyst Ben Parfit. So I tracked the 30 or so stories that were published between July and September of 2013, just the print media, not the broadcast or anything like that. And what this revealed was a really clear narrative in which pressure from the public actually helped push the provincial government to follow through on some commitments that had been made regarding BC's Out-of-Date Water Act. And these are commitments that could have fallen by the wayside. So the dialogue in all of this, this sort of media debate and discussion focused on BC's lack of groundwater regulations, um, the importance of accommodating First Nations rights and title, and also the need to just simply update the out-of-date Provincial Water Act. So as I said, it began with commentary from citizens and journalists, but by late summer, there was an op-ed published by the NDP environment critic, and this was followed by a response from the Minister of Environment herself stating that, yes, in fact, replacing the Water Act was a core priority for the province. So I really like this you know, case study, if we can call it that, um, because it really shows that decision makers do pay attention to media and also contribute themselves to dialogue in the public sphere. So as many of you, if not all of you on the call will already know, in spring of last year, BC's new Water Sustainability Act became law, and it's expected to come into force early next year in 2016. So this represented the culmination of nearly six years of consultation and engagement to modernize the out-of-date Water Act. 
The development of this new Water Sustainability Act was a largely transparent process, and the government provided multiple windows for public input on things like the proposed full legislation and other specific aspects of the Act. And many of these submissions were received through the government's Living Water Smart blog. So back in 2010, the first opportunity for public input in this process resulted in over 900 written submissions to government. And in 2013, the government website for leaving comments regarding the legislative proposal was visited more than 12,000 times. So it's clear that a lot of people are interested and invested in this particular law reform. The really positive thing about the development of the Water Sustainability Act is that this public response has been genuinely reflected and integrated as the government has drafted new papers or refinements. This isn't to say that every single recommendation has been incorporated, um, but what it does show is that the government has been listening, has taken time to actually wade through, analyze the feedback, and has certainly given public opinion some value. Now that the Act has passed, the province is currently in the midst of developing and figuring out the details of a number of important regulations, and these will in essence be the backbone of the Act. And while there's a chance that the government will lead additional specific windows for public engagement, for the most part these formal opportunities have closed. So the thing is, there's two factors at play. <laughs> One, it's well known in BC's water community, and I think increasingly in the community at large, that the quality of the regulations within this act are what will be the difference between a mediocre water sustainability act and actually a cutting edge piece of modern environmental legislation that could serve as an example for other jurisdictions. So it's really important that the government gets these regulations right. And these priority environmental regulations will include things like groundwater licensing, the protection of environmental and critical flow needs, and enabling regional water sustainability plans and shared watershed level decision making. The second factor that's at play here is that the public hasn't forgotten that it was brought along and given these opportunities to provide feedback for nearly six years. The update of BC's water law is a once in a century opportunity and as a result, many citizens groups, thinkers, and various sectors and individuals across the province still want to have a say, especially given how critical the regulations will be to sort of making or breaking this act. And so, this brings us back to the media. If the government itself will be providing fewer opportunities for formal, formal public engagement, um, there's no reason why individuals can't be empowered to make their opinions heard by turning to the public sphere. So as I mentioned earlier, media is an extremely important and influential outlet for exchanging opinions, discussing and deliberating, and eventually, as we saw, these conversations can influence public opinion and decision making. And as I just described through that example of this media buzz that happened a couple summers ago, previous experience shows us that government will likely be paying attention. In our role here at Polis, we've numerous times seen the impact <coughs> that media attention can have in leading to, for example, follow-up meetings or briefings with government on particular aspects of the act. And we've seen this sort of dual role that media can play in both amplifying a message and also helping to mainstream the content so that the government really does act in response. So there's a real opportunity to have your stories heard. And media engagement doesn't have to be hard if you do it right. But there are a number of challenges to being heard, particularly given the chaotic media landscape that I, that I showed you earlier. So at this point, we're going to kind of switch gears and, and move into focusing on some of these challenges. And this is where Dan is here to really offer some of his insight from the reporter side as a media worker. Um, and I'm here as more of a media source who provides stories. So our focus is going to mostly be on traditional media and things like engaging with editors, journalists, or radio producers. Um, social media is also very important 
And I will mention it briefly, but in many ways social media is another beast worthy of its own presentation entirely. So the first challenge that we want to focus on is the fact that environmental reporting is fickle. Coming back to Anders Hansen again, he said that the environmental beat has never really been stable, riding a cycle of ups and downs like an elevator. Things like public interest, events, and economic conditions all inform the priority of environmental news and mass media. So what this means is major events like wars or economic crises have a tendency to push the environment down or sometimes even off the media news agenda entirely. So what can you do about it? <laughs> Addressing the fact that environmental reporting is fickle can certainly be challenging since sometimes it's important to acknowledge that your story really isn't the most important or pressing thing to be reported at that time. But one important step is to do your research and to really try to be aware of the news cycle. So this means knowing when your story might be a good fit and when it might be better to wait. So as an example, if you know a major economic crisis or international conflict is dominating news reporting, it may be worth waiting on pitching your story about you know, local groundwater allocations until the hype has died down. On the flip side of that, though, if there is a major environmental story that's being picked up in the news, um, for example, the California drought, you need to take those opportunities. How might your story contribute a new perspective or voice to that ongoing narrative? Or could your story be reframed to better fit with media's current priorities around this topic? And at Polis here, we saw this recently, just last week, I'm sure many of you saw, we released a new report on uh, lessons from California for British Columbia as BC develops its groundwater regulations. And the report findings were covered in a front page story in the province last week and various other outlets. And I purposely tied the story about groundwater regulations in BC to California's drought situation when pitching it to media outlets because I knew that this was something that was sort of on the public's mind in the dialogue. This was being discussed in the public sphere. So Dan, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I can say from our end, because um, as Laura mentioned, we ran that story on the front page. It was our lead story for that day on the web. And um, yeah, I can say for sure that the way it was pitched to us and then the way I, well, the way it was pitched to me and then the way I pitched it to my editors, tying it around California, which is this big international story, um, I think that really, I was telling Laura and Oliver and the other people at Bullis, probably really made the difference between my editors choosing to, you know, on one side, run a story about uh, a water expert report being published, just running a story, or on the other hand, running that story on the front page, making it the lead story on the website, uh, giving it more space in the paper, uh, including a video for the web, doing a big sort of, you know, devoting more resources, more time, more space to it, and giving it more prominence. And that's just sort of our specific, um, uh, our, our specific outlet. Um, but then I did notice, I couldn't say, uh, I mean, Laura would have to say how the, that story compares with other reports Polis has done, but it certainly seemed from my end, just as a media consumer, that um, a lot of, it seemed like it got a lot of good play in the media. I saw it on TV. I heard interviews on the radio with the report's authors. It seemed like that uh, got a lot of pickup. Um, and it's still, I'm still seeing it come up, I guess, two weeks later or a week and a half later. Uh, it seems like it's gotten a lot of traction, I would say, from my end, yeah. I think that's a good example of that, of tying it to a bigger story. Yeah, and, it, and it's not always possible. I mean, my job yeah, was sure. made a bit easy this time. Um, and, <laughs> and being aware of that news cycle, we've been working on this report for a while before all of the kind of, you know, onslaught of, of news about the California drought. And the timing just happened to work. And also that Monday before our report came out was when the government, the BC government, um, issued their um, yeah. voluntary watering restrictions, water conservation, um, so there was just all of these factors that aligned. So sometimes you'll hit that sweet spot, other times you have to work a bit harder, which I've certainly done as well. <laughs> so, and maybe uh, just as a quick aside, it, it's probably worth noting that like sometimes those factors don't line up in your favor, and then maybe it's a good, not to take it too personally, like there's just some stuff you can't control. So 
Uh, sometimes it works out for you, and sometimes it, I guess it doesn't. If it had rained the two weeks leading up to the report, release of that report, in, if it had rained all over BC, it might have been a tougher sell. But yeah, not much um, you can do about that. So coming to point three on here, we're still, what can you do about fickle environmental reporting being fickle? Yeah. Um, it's also really important to be informed about the outlets that you're wanting to engage. So yes, environmental reporting is fickle at large, but there are definitely journalists who have a specific interest in environmental issues, like Dan, who we have here on the call today. Um, so do you want to talk a bit about your experience with this, Dan? Sure, yeah. Um, so I don't, I mean, as uh, Laura mentioned, I don't know of a lot of sort of designated environmental reporters, like people who were full-time on an environmental beat at sort of general interest publications. Obviously, there's sort of specialty publications or specialty outlets. But in BC specifically, I don't know of a lot of people who are full-time just environmental issues. But you'll definitely notice um, some journalists are more inclined to do stories about the environment. Um, so it is important to read local papers, you know, everything from sort of smaller community newspapers to trade publications to bigger sort of mass market publications and broadcast. Um, and something that, I don't, like, I don't know, when I mentioned this to Laura, it might be worthwhile paying attention to bylines. So most, pe the only people normally who pay attention to bylines, like, you know, the name of the reporter who wrote the story, usually the only people who pay attention to bylines are other journalists. Most people, you know, most readers never really pay attention to the bylines, which is fine, obviously, nobody cares. But if you're, if you're going to be pitching stuff, it might be worthwhile to sort of pay attention to the bylines. And something Laura suggested to me when we were talking about this before, and was you can even sort of have a scorecard. You keep track of who's writing about issues that relate to what you're interested in. So if one reporter writes a few sort of environmental stories within a month, uh, that's a good indication that they might be a good bet to pitch directly to. And... Um, if you can, the more you can sort of tailor your pitch to uh, a specific reporter, I mean, if somebody calls, if somebody just sends me an email that they've obviously sent to 100 other people and copied and pasted it, it's, it's easier to ignore that pitch or, you know, it's harder to pick it up. But if somebody e emails me and says, hi, Dan, I've read your stories about this and this and this, and because you've covered these issues in the past, I think this might be a fit and I, I've got something I want to tell you about, it's, I'm, that's going to get my attention a lot more. And then conversely, I think it'll get my editor's attention when I take it to my editor. And um, you'll see some reporters do a lot of sort of general environmental stuff. And some have a r even more specific, like, focused particular niches. Like, the first example that come to my mind, just because I've seen stories by them in the last week or two, are uh, Mark Hume at the Globe and Mail does a lot of really great stories that involve fish habitats. So that's sort of even a more specific kind of water uh, water related reporting. And Gordon Hextra at the Vancouver Sun does uh, a lot of stories involving uh, impacts on the environment, including water, uh, around mining and resource industry. So he would be a good bet for anything that has to do with that. Um, or, of course, you know, please feel free to pitch me also, anything. <laughs> but um, so those are just like uh, those are just kind of a couple of the first things that would come to my mind. But if you do keep track of bylines, I think you'll probably start to notice those patterns. So that might be worthwhile. Great. So the second challenge has to do with cultivating relationships with journalists. And if you don't already have good connections with competent local reporters um, or broadcasters, it certainly can be difficult to break in. And there's some really discouraging quotes out there, that this one here from a feature writer at the Minneapolis Star Tribune saying, a lot of what gets covered depends on personal relationships at the paper. And while I'm sure that's true, I don't think that this needs to be a barrier to engaging with media. While they can be helpful, while personal connections can be helpful, they certainly aren't essential. And this is particularly true if you have some basic knowledge and etiquette in your back pocket before you start making cold calls. So what can you do about it? Um, I think overall, one really important thing to keep in mind is that relationship building takes time. This is true of any relationship. Um, and from my experience, to really succeed in building relationships with reporters and media outlets, um, it needs to be thoughtful and it also needs to be personal. So um, I think the first point here, know how to write a good pitch, or also known as a query letter. Um, this is the, something that's usually written before the story, and you should make this as concise, compelling, and targeted as the news story itself. This is basically your letter of introduction. 
Um, generally, you send to only one outlet at a time. Um, as Dan said, group emails are generally a bad idea, as are generic press releases. They're really easy to ignore. Uh, one exception to that, of course, is unless maybe you're pr promoting an event. Um, yeah, really there's, there is certainly a place for generic press releases, I guess, but it, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, yeah, if you're releasing a report or whatever, yeah. Knowing the editor and who to send it to is also really important. Um, you know, actually put somebody's name at the top of your pitch email and send it to them personally. Um, just knowing the outlet, some of what Dan said, looking at bylines, things like this. And also timing matters. From my experience at Polis, um, I found that giving an exclusive can really make a journalist care. Um, it depends on your story. It depends, you know, how badly you want it to run in one particular outlet. Um, but that is one approach. Um, and as I said, any email should be thoughtful and personal. So, for example, what recent stories has that journalist covered on the same topic, and how might your story fit with that? Show that you've done your research. Show that you actually have a vested interest in working with this particular person. And Dan, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, and one thing uh, that Laura and I sort of spoke about beforehand is when you're pitching, um, is just kind of understanding the hectic nature of m most reporters' days. And so everyone's busy. It's not that reporters are any more busy or less busy than anyone else, but sometimes they just can't control their own schedule because of assignments they're getting from above or things that are happening. Today's an example. It's supposed to be my day off. And I mean, um, so I'm sort of sitting here on a bench outside of the Supreme Court waiting for trial to start. And I just, I couldn't control it because it got rescheduled and some work on my day off. And so if you, some, sometimes I get pitches that are actually really, really good pitches and they're perfectly done. And I just am not able to do anything about it because it's out of my hands. So I think just kind of understanding that, rolling with the punches and don't take it personally if you do pitch and it doesn't work out because sometimes it's honestly not your fault and it's not the reporter's fault. It's just sometimes it is probably the reporter's fault that they missed out on a good pitch. But I've definitely missed out on really good pitches that seemed like really promising stories just because I couldn't, there was nothing I could do about it at the time. So try, try not to take it personally if that happens and just understand. And then, and you know, don't hesitate to go back to the same reporter if, if, if you want to and uh, try again if you do want to in the future. Um, and I would say just when you are pitching, especially if it's someone you don't have a relationship with, if you don't have an established relationship with a reporter, I think in general, most editors and reporters don't like receiving uh, unsolicited cold calls or pitches by phone. I would caution against just phoning up the newsroom being like, hey, I've got an idea. Email is better, I think, for most, I, I can speak for myself, but also for most other people I talk to, especially editors, their days are so hectic and they're just sort of dealing with so many different balls in the air. So I think email is definitely better. Um, and it is, I guess, acceptable to fall. If, if you're emailing, a, if you're offering an exclusive and you send it by email that you don't hear back in a day or two, depending on what the time frame of your story is, like you might only have a given window for your own story, it's okay. Maybe follow up with another polite email. Hey, just wanted to follow up. Did you get my earlier email? And if they don't reply to that and you do want to follow up on the phone, I think that's okay. But, um, but be willing to, you know, if they don't get back to you after a decent amount of time, depending on what, again, depending on what your own time frame is for the story, um, you can, you know, move on. You can even give the reporter a deadline and say, look, I, I, if, if you're not interested in this, that's totally okay, but I'll need to sort of talk to somebody else. So if you can let me know by tomorrow at noon, one way or the other, um, you know, let's chat. Here's my cell number. Um, and if they don't get back to you, move on to somebody else. Um, and obviously sometimes you're going to have a really tight time frame to get a story out there. So in that case, you might need to contact a bunch of reporters at once and, you know, throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. But in general, uh, yeah, phoning, I would say, is kind of a last resort, uh, again, unless you have a personal relationship with the reporter already. And, of course, sending a pitch at this, you, most of you probably know this, but if you're sending a pitch at, like, 5 p.m. on a Friday, it's probably a bad idea, especially if it's a, you know, time-sensitive story. Actually, whether it is or not, really. I mean, because most editors aren't going to be getting in on Monday morning and going back through their weekend emails. Uh, I mean, they might, but it's just... It, you there's a good chance it might get lost in the shuffle and you could have something really good. So if you wait till Monday morning, it might be a lot more successful. If you think about that, that's what big companies and governments, like when they have to release bad news, they always do it on a Friday afternoon at 4.45 p.m. Hopefully, ideally before a long weekend in the summer, right? That's what they hope. Um, that's how stories get buried. So you don't want your story to get buried. So, you know, trying to do it in the morning on a weekday or something is probably your best bet. Great. Does that make sense, Laura? Absolutely.
So the third challenge has to do with the fact that different sectors have different resources and capacities when it comes to media engagement. The most successful quote unquote spin doctors tend to come from business. Um, and the business world is nearly four times as likely as NGOs, charities, or pressure groups to place their PR material into news sources. And government ministries also tend to have really sophisticated communications department, often with a lot of former journalists employed. So this is a bit of a tricky challenge to talk about, since those of you from business or government are certainly leading the way here. Um, the reason I bring up this point is because I think it's important for everyone to be aware of some of the inequalities and the competition that can be out there when trying to make your voice or your story heard. To my mind, in an ideal world, there would be a perfect balance of perspectives in the dialogue that's happening in the public sphere. But the reality is that it's competitive out there. Now, of course, there are certainly some extremely media savvy NGOs um, and research organizations and things like this, but these do tend to be the exception to the rule. So the real take home message here is that non-business organizations, non-governmental organizations are likely facing skilled competition when trying to pitch their stories. So if you do fall into this category, I think this is worth keeping in mind when you're engaging with media to ensure that your approach and messaging are as clear, professional, and engaging as possible. Did you have anything to add here, Dan? Um, yeah, uh, this is just something, I mean, this is something that uh, journalists talk a lot about. Uh, journalists talk a lot about this issue amongst each other as well, just about, um, I mean, I've only been sort of reporting for a few years, but you talk to some of the people who have been maybe, you know, at the same reporting job for 20 years or 30 years, and they say it, how the landscape has really changed out there over the years. Um, I was just recently reading about this, and uh, a story cited some stats, some data from Stats Can, uh, saying in 1991 there were about 10,000 more PR people than journalists in Canada. So that was in 91. Um, but by the most recent census, that gap had grown from 10,000 to 41,000. Now there's 41,000 more PR professionals than journalists in Canada. And 20 years ago, the ratio of PR people to journalists was less, a little less than 2 to 1. Now it's more than 4 to 1. So journalists are kind of feeling like they're dealing with a more and more uh, professional communications people, which can be good. I mean, so a lot of the communications people, whether they're in government or NGOs or uh, big business, I mean, some of them are great to deal with, and a lot of the times they're very helpful. But it's not the same as uh, sort of talking to real people with their sort of boots on the ground in a community, and obviously they all uh, have their own sort of vested interests that they're trying to promote, whether it's a specific business or industry or whatever. Um, so we're always, um, yeah, trying to work as collaboratively and collegially as possible with those folks. Um, and yeah, uh, in the, um, in a lot of those professional PR jobs, a lot of those people are former journalists, right? A lot of people go from journalism into either government communications or corporate communications or, uh, doing PR for NGOs and things like that. So, um, yeah, so it just, I guess trying to work together as much as possible is always one of our goals because a lot of the big organizations do have so many, so many resources. Great. So in terms of what you can do about it, these, these imbalances, um, for those organizations with more limited resources and capacity, I really think that practice can make all the difference. Regarding successful pitches, um, I recommend talking to your colleagues in other organizations. Ask them to share their successful pitch pitches and the stories that resulted. You can really learn a lot by this type of sharing. Um, and as shown on the screen here, there's also some really good resources and guides designed specifically for folks from different backgrounds and sectors. Um, so a couple of books that I'm familiar with are, are up here, um, designed for NGOs and activists. Another one is designed for scientists. Um, but the information in these books is certainly relevant to broader audiences as well. And the third logo up on the slide here um, comes from a recent series that the Taiyi newspaper focused on um, called Communications Tips for Concerned Citizens. And you can find that series of articles through the Taiyi's Toolkit for Change. 
And as an example of the value of you know, some of these good quality resources, Making the News, the first book here, it walks the reader through all manner of ways of engaging media, including you know, staging a media event, developing a simple message, determining what's newsworthy, writing news releases, contacting reporters, pitching stories, and on and on and on. Um, so if you really are sort of starting you know, from, from square one, um, I'd recommend some of these resources because a lot of thought has gone into them and I think it can really up your game if you're needing that. The fourth challenge that I want to talk about is what I like to call the authority orientation of news coverage. And what this means is that news media tends to turn to politicians, scientists, and experts for definitions of and commentary on issues. So NGOs, environmental pressure groups, and members of the general public tend to be less sought after for interviews and quotes. And this can be a challenge for both experts and non-experts. Um, media does often want an expert voice, but many experts have never been trained to talk to media in a way that's engaging for a general lay audience. This is why on the previous slide that book for how can scientists talk to media even exists. And from the other side of the equation, those boots on the ground groups, even though they may have an abundance of knowledge, are not necessarily considered credible quote unquote experts for quotes in a media story. So, what can you do about it? Um, again, do your research. Some outlets do like to pair a quote from an expert with an NGO or activist voice. And Dan, I, I, I tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that this generally mm. is true um, at the province. Is that correct? I would say yeah, uh, for sure. It's um, it's it definitely makes the story a lot more compelling if you have real human beings whose lives are affected. Uh, by a, by a story, either their health or their economic livelihood or just their community. You know, the classic, uh, I don't know how many stories we run with concerned citizens standing with their arms crossed in, in front of something. But, I mean, it, it gets used in, over and over because it, it works. But then conversely, if you just have this concerned citizen and then there's no sort of quote-unquote expert to back up what they're saying, it might seem a little lighter. So, yeah, I, I always like to try to use both of those things. You've got the expert saying, this is a real concern for this reason, this reason, this reason. And somebody, you know, who's got a fancy title and somebody who's got maybe, you know, decades of experience and education and they're an expert. And then you've got the pers person or ideally people who are, have got their boots on the ground. And, yeah, I, I, ideally it's good to have both, I think. Yeah, so if, if you're pitching to an outlet where you know that they like to have both, this may not actually be that big of a challenge for you, um, but if it is an outlet that tends towards this authority orientation, um, you may need to, if you fall into more of the boots on the ground category, really make the case for your credibility. And I think that the, the best way to do this is to really situate yourself and your particular expertise in a very honest way. So mm -hmm. in your pitch, for example, you can mention things like you have on the ground experience, you represent real people in the community who care passionately about and deal with this issue every day, and you bring your own package of expertise given your direct local connection to the issue. Um, it's also really important that you do know the issue and know your facts, um, and true of any sort of media engagement, always be prepared to be quoted. Um, and I think also if you can, depending which side of this you fall on, whether you're the expert camp or more sort of the NGO camp, um, it's worthwhile to suggest somebody from that other perspective that could complement your story that the reporter may want to follow up with. So not only would you be a source for the story itself, but you can provide some of these other relationships and, and voices. Mm -hmm. And the final, the final thing here has to do with making yourself available as Dan said, reporters work on a tight deadline. They need to be able to respond quickly. So sort of domino effect, you need to be able to respond quickly as well. Um, and I'm sure, Dan, that you can talk a bit more about um, the importance of your sources being available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, it doesn't mean that you know you need to bend over backwards to accommodate this reporter, but it's just sometimes that it, it is going to be the difference between a story making the paper or not making the paper or a story making the paper with like eight inches on the 15th page or being the front page story with 22 inches on page three or something like that. Um, it, you know, that I'm thinking of a tablet because our paper is tablet format, you know, or in terms of having a big story above the fold and a broadsheet newspaper or, you know, having your story at the start of the, uh, 
the 6 p.m. news as opposed to a short story at the end of the news. Because if, if they've got interviews with people on camera, that makes that bumps up the story. It's not just about how important the story is, frankly. I mean, that maybe sounds bad, but it's not. That's not the only factor that goes into determining where it plays in the news. It's it's also about what kind of photos do you have? How many people do you have talking? Do you have people talking on camera? Um, so if you say, oh, I'm not I'm not available to do an on camera interview, it might sort of shuffle. That's fine, and that's your choice, but it might chip away at how much coverage your story gets, right? If you can make yourself available, you can give yourself a better chance of getting that story out there. I would so say. The, fifth, the fifth challenge that we're going to talk about, um, again, circles back to the fact that we live in this age of media saturation. As I already mentioned, we're consuming media at an increasing rate. Um, and in the study by James Short that I mentioned earlier, he states that hours of consumption grew at just over 5% per year from 2008 to 2013. Um, and this was due to a combination of increasing viewership per capita from 11 hours per day to 14 hours per day, um, and also population growth plays into that a little bit as well. On the radio this morning, actually, just before um, we started this presentation, I heard that YouTube is figuring out a way to make their top news clips more easily searchable. Um, okay. Don't quote me on this because I may have sort of misheard, but I'm pretty sure what the what the broadcaster said was that um, five million viewer hours of news coverage are logged per day um, on YouTube. So that's like kind of mind-blowing. So they're actually figuring out a way to sort and, and make those top stories better accessible. So this is very current. <laughs> <laughs> so what can you do about it? Um, as I mentioned, traditional media outlets are still extremely important, dominating about 60% of media consumption. But I think it's important to say, what about that other 40%? Um, the current media landscape really lends itself to some creative ways of engaging that move away from traditional approaches of simply pitching to journalists or broadcasters and hoping that they like your story. Um, there's certainly no need to feel limited to simply pitching your ideas to journalists. And there's a whole world of what I like to call do-it-yourself media out there. Um, some of this still involves engaging with traditional media, but just in different ways. So a little list here. Um, one is write an op-ed. This is something that we often do here at Polis. Um, if you have an opinion on a topic, if you have enough expertise, or if you can partner with somebody whose name you know might really have some weight, um, write an op-ed and pitch that to the editorial section rather than hoping a journalist covers your story themselves. Um, writing letters to the editor is also a great way to start to contribute your voice to the, to the dialogue happening in the public sphere. If there's a story that's happened and you feel strongly about it, write in to the newspaper. What was your reaction? What was your experience? Um, and this is the same for online stories. You know, you can comment in the section below. And if there's enough people, sort of these trends in public feedback, again, this is the sort of thing that government and decision makers will pay attention to. Using social media effectively is also a really important tool. As I said, this isn't something that we're going to get into in this particular presentation. Um, one example, though, is blogging. Again, tell your own story. Um, if you don't have your own blog, there's some very reputable outlets out there that may take guest bloggers, and you can actually tell your story yourself. These last two here are things that we often do at Polis, um, host an event or use a recently released report as a bit of a hook to get the attention. I'll, I'll just wait till that siren passes. Sorry, I'll, I'll mute for Oh, you're totally fine. <laughs> um, so rather than just sort of, here's the facts, you know, there's this event happening, there's some high profile people coming, we're going to be talking about this issue. It has a lot more intrigue and interest um, leading to a media story than just, you know, here's some facts about something that we think is important. And same with the report, you know, in a report released today, that is a lot more flashy than in a report released five months ago, or, you know, I was just sort of thinking about something, and um, so some of it does have to do with a bit of that framing. So this brings us to the summary slide, and Dan, you may want to unmute. I'm sure you have something to contribute here. <laughs> um, 
The first thing I want to say is the public sphere is waiting for your opinion. Um, and as you've seen sort of through the examples in this presentation, your opinion really can make a difference. I think that's what I most want to kind of drive home today. Um, secondly, media engagement isn't hard if you do it well. As I said, if you have some of this etiquette, some of these tools, some of these approaches, um, you can really start to build good relationships. Because engaging in media is about relationships, and as I said, this can take time. So don't get discouraged, um, and as Dan said, don't take it personally if you don't hear back right away. Um, it probably has nothing to do with you at all. <laughs> media engagement yeah. is a critical component of any long-term effective campaign, um, be that law reform, local issues, or simply issues of awareness raising. And I think if you want to be an influential organization, it's really important to engage media consistently and regularly. It doesn't need to be a frightening thing. It just, you know, if you can sort of keep away at it, and as I said, get that practice, share pitches, just keep doing it, um, I think you'll really start to see some changes over time and your stories being heard more and more frequently. And finally, there really is no simple formula. Everything Dan and I have presented, I think, is very useful and good foundational place. Um, but yeah, there's any number of ways to make this happen. So my biggest advice is to just get started and really learn by doing. And I think to bring it back to the BC Water Act, as we know, there's a once in a century opportunity right now to influence the Water Sustainability <coughs> Act to ensure it can be as strong as it can possibly be. And as we know, this will depend on the details being worked out in the regulations. And media provides a real opportunity to make some noise and ensure that decision makers know that this is a priority. So that's all I have to say. Do you, uh, do you want to add to that, Dan? Um, I think that covers it off really well. And again, I mean, my, you know, what my contribution to this is kind of just based mostly on my own experience, which is just kind of doing this for the last few years, I'm still relatively new, and then based on conversations with, you know, I've had with other people in the business, but it's possible that other reporters might have, a, you know, a different perspective on this. This is kind of just my own take, but I mean, I would really uh, emphasize what Laura was saying about don't take it personally if you do pitch. Sometimes people uh, are pit pitch stories and they do everything totally right and it just doesn't work out for some reason. And, you know, I'll apologize just in case there's anyone on this call who's maybe tried to pitch me personally stories in the past <laughs> that didn't work out for one reason or another. But um, it happens, and I would encourage you to try again in the future. And, um, yeah, as Laura says, this is a once-in-a-century thing that's happening, really. So might as well try to make hay while the sun shines and uh, get in touch and try to get those stories out there. Great. So thank you to everybody who's on the call. Um, I don't know how much longer we have Dan. I, I think we have him for at least five minutes. He said he no, may. I'm, 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 yeah, I've got a bit of time. I'm okay for a little bit. I just okay. got to text in the, the, the judges in something earlier. It's, anyway, so I'm, I'm good. Okay, perfect. So um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Just to advance the slide here. Um, I can bring out our list of resources now. I don't know, Laura, if you'd like to speak to them. Um, they're mostly compiled by you. So the first three you gave in your presentation, and then there's a couple articles as well. Did you want to speak to those, Laura? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the first three are just the three that were on that one slide that I showed. Um, a couple of books that may be of interest, um, depending on your background, if you're looking for some sort of media <laughs> advice. Um, the third one is the Taiyi Toolkit for Change, which was this series of articles. Um, the next one actually was one that Dan recommended or suggested. Um, it was a cover story written by Rachel Pan, who's in the audience here, um, last year for Water Canada magazine. And I think, Dan, you were perhaps interviewed for this. Um, and it's called Putting Water on Page One. So basically, yeah, how can we really raise the profile of water issues um, and giving some really interesting examples of that. Um, and the last one was an interview. Water Canada, as we said at the beginning, they're, they're our media sponsors, so they always do an interview um, with the speakers before each of these webinars. So this time it happened to be me. So um, most of what's in the interview I've probably touched on in this presentation, but if you're interested, you can check that out as well. Great. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I can just 
we're waiting for some questions to come in, just draw your attention to some of the resources that people are sharing in the chat box. So, Gay, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Gaythea Weiss, um, she shared a resource. She thinks that, uh, I think that PR positioning or SIN promoting vested interest gets to the crux of what we need to be considering about science communication. And she likes the work of Dan Can of uh, Yale Law on Cultural Cognition. She's got a link there in the chat box for folks to look at. And another resource or comment from Ian Hinkle uh, regarding the YouTube news bit. Um, so Google News is said to identify trending topics in real time. It's got a link there that you can check out. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Ian. Yeah, it was just one of these. I turned on the radio and I was like, wow, this is extremely timely and I just caught a little bit of it. So that's great. I'll check that out. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, and then from Nicole Hancock, uh, so she's saying that they're trying to start a blog. Does anyone have any software recommendations? Putting that out there. I know that WordPress is good. That would be a good place to start. Yeah, I, I don't, um, we, we don't have a blog at Polis, and I, I haven't blogged in a while, but as far as I know, I think WordPress, if you're looking for free um, option, and you can have your own domain name and stuff, um, I think WordPress probably still is. They have tons of templates and stuff, um, but yeah, that's not really my area of expertise. So somebody else in the room might be able to offer you something, Nicole. Yeah, sorry, I don't yeah. actually know too much about it either. I think WordPress is, is it seems to be the, most popular and best option, but I don't know too much. About yeah. It. Somebody else might be able to speak. Yeah. Uh, so Nicole had a question as well. Um, so what do you do if you're asked a question and you don't know the answer? Uh, she says, I tend to avoid the media or refer them to others because I'm not a scientist, and she's worried that they'll ask things that she doesn't know the answers to. So any any tips on that, Laura or Dan? Yeah, I would I, say I, from I, oh, go ahead. Oh no, you you can go first. <laughs> from my perspective, just be totally honest. It's actually totally okay to not know the answer to something. Uh, I have no problem if, frankly, if I'm interviewing someone and they have a, and this does happen sometimes. Sometimes you interview people, and any question you ask them, they go off on like a big spiel, and they've got a bunch of really cool, you know, sexy sounding quotes. And you realize that anything you ask them, they've got a whole spiel on it. And nobody knows everything. Nobody's an expert on everything. So that actually makes me think someone's less credible. It makes me think they just really want to have their name and their face in the paper. If somebody tells me sometimes, if I ask them questions that say, honestly, I don't know that much about this. Maybe you should talk to this person or that person. Or if they say, you know, I think it's, don't quote me on this. I, my understanding is that it works like this and da-da-da. Don't quote me on that. I'm not an expert. I'd love it if you talk to someone else. But maybe that would put you in the right direction. If someone's honest with me and they tell me that they don't know about certain things, I'm way more likely to take them seriously and think they're credible. Um, so just just be totally honest. And, um, you know, if, if a reporter talks to you and asks you a few questions and you, you don't know about any of the stuff they're talking about, that's not a waste of the reporter's time. And, and you, you might not end up being in the story, but maybe it, it, those conversations can still be totally helpful. A lot of times, I, you know, maybe I'll talk to 10 people and only end up quoting two or three of them in a story, but those other seven conversations that I had can be really helpful because sometimes they put you on to, oh, but I did see this article that was in National Geographic 10 years ago, and you go dig that up, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. Or, you, or they say, you know, but I do know this professor over at UVic, and they could talk to you about it. So those conversations can be very, very helpful. Um, so, yeah, the key thing, I just, just yeah, don't, don't, it's totally fine to say you don't know. It's actually really good to say you don't know. Just be honest, yeah. I think. Yeah, and that, that was going to be my exact answer um, when I'm sort of, you know, teaching people who haven't had a lot of media engagement, you know, they're going to be sort of pushed off the deep end and go for an interview. Um, that's one of the main things that I tell people is if you don't know the answer, that's totally fine. Um, and you can try to bring it back to what you do know. You know, I don't know about yeah. that, but that's sort of related to this, which, you know, is my area of expertise. Um, with print media, you it, it's a bit less stressful because, you know, you aren't being live broadcast. For radio, I find it can be a bit more frightening if you get a question that you don't know. Um, but again, you can just say, you know, that's not my area of expertise, um, but it's a great question. And, you know, <laughs> maybe somebody out there, yeah. Um, 
but again, just being really honest. Um, and as I said earlier, not being frightened. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, people are scared to engage with media because they're scared of saying the wrong thing. But if you can just know what you know um, and, and really, you know, stick to that, um, it can really lead to some positive relationships. Here's one other thing I'll throw out there quickly is um, I've had, sometimes I've had editors tell me this, uh, is that, you know, our job is to report the facts, right? But, like, emotions are valid. Emotions are facts. I mean, the things that people feel, whether if they're scared about their community or they're nervous about some kind of environmental catastrophe that could happen, don't we, – we sometimes in the media we tend to discount people's feelings and emotions, but those things can be important. So if a, if a reporter asks you some question about, oh, you know, what do you think about this legislative change – and, you know, how does this position BC as a global resource? But if they ask you something that you don't feel comfortable with answering, um, you can just say, you know, I don't know about global economics and the resource industry, but I'm worried about my watershed and I worry about my kids growing up and, and I'm afraid of this. Your emotions, you know your emotions and nobody else does. That can be valid. And you know what, if, if you give them and they choose not to use that, then that's fine. But don't sort of write that off. That can be a valid thing. Great. Thanks, Dan. And just let us know when you need to duck out. I know you're pressed for time, so don't feel bad if you need to sign out. Um, but we did have a I'm, question. I'm okay. So, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, I'm okay for a bit. Um, so. so we had a question from Oliver Brandis targeted to Dan. Uh, so he says, Dan, do you want to comment on how important or not important the role of the pitch is? Um, also point you to some other experts or impacted folks for the reporter to interview to help buttress the story. So like how much is doing some of the reporter's work helpful um, and including and making some introductions and connections? And yeah, for sure. Kind of um, yeah, um, I, uh, I think I heard most of the question, but, uh, but I can't read it because I'm not logged on to the thing. But yeah, in general, I, I, I guess in short, if you can do a bit of the reporter's work for them, and not to make us sound lazy, but it definitely helps a lot. I mean, if you can say, here's what this story is, and this expert, this expert, and this expert could talk to you about this. Um, now, I mean, any good reporter is not just going to take that and run with it. They'll try to make their own phone calls and independently corroborate and verify what they're hearing. But that can be make a big, big difference. If, if you do a little bit of the reporter's work for them um, by giving them ideas uh, and resources and sources uh, that will help move the story along, um, yeah, I would say that makes a huge difference. And sometimes I've even had like one unique example I think of was um, someone from an environmental group got in touch and they had put together this really cool infographic. It was from uh, someone from the Wilderness Committee and they were, they were like, that was something they said, you know, you guys can use this. No one else has used this as long as you give credit, obviously. But it was a really cool infographic, like an image that really told a story. And that was something, I mean, it, it sort of helped take care of the... Uh, visual element of our story and that's kind of a unique that's the only time I think of where that specific thing happened but yeah generally and um, and I know Oliver has done that very well uh, with his own pitches uh, providing other experts to talk to and uh, other resources so, yeah it makes a huge difference great thanks Dan uh, do you have any thoughts you want to add to that Laura no I think Dan covered it good okay uh, so we'll move along to a question from Susie porter Bop of Canadian Freshwater Alliance. Um, so she says, I find a huge challenge in working with smaller groups is tying their very local story um, that they're incredibly excited about to something that would be of interest to the region mm. beyond that community. Uh, she says that we suggest connecting to things like current drought conditions or the California mm. story or other current issues that might not have been uh, totally related but work in that hook context. Uh, she says that I think the recent Global Mail story on the Cowich and Weir situation did this really well, and I think she's provided a link to that in the chat box as well. So any, any thoughts on that, Laura and Dan? Yeah, yeah. I would agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as would I. Um, I think, if, if I can go first, I think um, this is where you really do have to get 
creative. Um, and sometimes it may just be a local story, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I can't remember the, the statistic off the top of my head, but um, local news, particularly local TV news, is one of the best outlets for reaching sort of general audience um, in a local community. People really watch local TV news. Um, so, and just because it's a local issue, um, yeah, it doesn't mean that it has to tie into something bigger. Um, but of course, when we're talking about law reform and, you know, all of these individual local stories across the province, you know, somehow relating to um, this, you know, new Water Sustainability Act, um, I think that there certainly are linkages that can be made um, in terms of, you know, the government or decision makers seeing um, some of these trends perhaps across the province. So even if it's a local story, if it ties into the fact that, you know, this situation might not have happened if this regulation was in place or something like that, um, I think that can really help further dialogue in the public sphere like I sort of described it in the presentation. Do you want to add to that, Dan? Yeah. Um, just those local stories are actually really important and can be a very valuable way to make bigger stories actually sort of resonate with people and mean something. I mean, if you just do a story uh, about policy and legislation and laws and legal frameworks and whatever, it can be pretty dry. But if you show uh, actual human beings whose lives are being affected by it, uh, that can make a big difference. And yeah, that, the, the recent Globe and Mail story with the couch and river was a good example. I think that was Mark Hume, actually, the, uh, the reporter I mentioned earlier. And in our recent story about uh, California, the California drought and the new Polis report, we mentioned the Cowichan River as well, uh, just as, as, as a good example. And that's, that was, that's kind of an interesting example because the Cowichan people had been, I'd been in touch with them for a long time and I'd been interested in doing a story about it, but I couldn't figure out exactly how to make it work. And then when this Polis story came along, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to sort of tell this story about their river getting drier and drier. Um, and then we used it. And I don't know, another expression I've heard journalists say, and I'm not exactly sure I know what it means, but I think I kind of know is the bigger, the smaller, the smaller, the bigger. So for a really, really big, big issue, trying to tell some specific story about some person in a little community, wherever, make it really, really local, and then, and then it resonates, it sort of hits home how that, that is just one kind of small example of how this bigger issue affects lots of other people. So. I, those community groups are so, so important, but sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes it's, as Susie said, it's a matter of fitting it into a bigger narrative. Um, and again, it's, sometimes it's kind of just dumb luck how your story might fit into something bigger that's going on. But, but you can, I mean, you can help um, do, as kind of going back to Oliver's suggestion, you can help do some of the reporters' work with that. If, uh, if you've got a, an issue going on in your um, backyard and you can show how some, uh, say, regulatory gap that exists either in BC or federally is, cause, is allowing this to happen, or you find some other example of where it's happening in a different community in a totally different part of the province, and you guys are separated by, you know, miles and miles, but you've got this thing in common, um, and figure out how it happens. Uh, again, you know, not asking you to do all the reporters' work for them, but that can really go a long way towards making, helping your story get out there, I would say. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so we have a specific question now from Renee Clark. She's asking, how should local governments counteract misinformation or negative press in the media? So, I mean, obviously neither of you are working in the local government right now, but um, we could open it up maybe. How do you counteract misinformation or negative press that you might be getting? Any tips or thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, presume to tell governments how to do their jobs I don't or like government communications people but I would say misinformation and negative press can be different things right sometimes there's press that is critical of what a government is doing or failing to do uh, sometimes it's critical but it's it's absolutely correct and it's doing its job that's part of the press's job right if there's misinformation that's a totally different thing and any news organization should take it very very seriously so um, if there is misinformation out there, uh, I would, you know, certainly con maybe contact the reporter, contact the news agency and say, hey, uh, this is wrong, explain how it's wrong, explain exactly which, what is inaccurate, 
and they should they should issue a correction or a retraction. If they don't, then I don't know. I guess you would have um, you would have to deal with it some other way. But I mean, from my perspective, just even when I'm writing stories that are critical of governments, I want the government to talk to me. Like I've had stories where sometimes the government just doesn't talk to you, doesn't answer questions that I frankly I think it would look better if the government, whether it's city, provincial, federal, it can be very hard to get answers from the federal government sometimes, you know, they're in Ottawa, it's, it's tough sometimes. But uh, to my mind, like, the more information you can get from them, the better, as opposed to just having, either not having their voice or saying, you know, questions to the ministry of blah, blah, blah were not returned. Um, sometimes they don't get back to you until a few days after your deadline, and it's like, sorry, I would have included you if I could. Um, so I think trying to prevent negative trying to help get your voice out there if you're again I don't want to tell governments what to do but if you get your voice out there I would there's a way to do it um, get, get your voice into the story um, and uh, you know as a reporter I think it's always totally fair I try to give people a very clear idea of what the story is going to say about them beforehand um, so it's not like a big surprise uh, but again they just have to be willing to talk to me and I'd like them to ask me questions and talk to me be available um, but yeah it, it, if there's misinformation then that's a very serious thing if there's a inaccuracy or a problem in the story then you should jump on that immediately talk uh, talk to the reporter talk to the editors the news organization um and that should be clarified and i mean if it's something really egregious if they made a big mistake um you know it, it would be worth maybe ask them to run a letter to the editor or something like that um clarifying the position I think about, this has nothing to do with water or the environment, but just recently the Globe and Mail had a big investigation about an Ontario politician, and it was kind of controversial. I, I, I'm not saying they made any mistakes, but from his point of view, from this politician's point of view, he said, this is bogus. And so the Globe and Mail ran a big, long uh, letter from him basically refuting some of these claims, saying that, you know, giving his side of the story. So even though it wasn't an error or a retraction or anything like that, it was, a cha it, it was I think, you know, a, a fair way for them to say, they gave him some space to give his side of the story. Um, so, yeah. I yeah, I think I think everything that Dan has said makes sense. Um, again, I think it's it, it's not something that I have a lot of experience with, Renee, um, having to sort of counteract negative press. But I think you know, really thinking about media in terms of this public sphere as an arena where debate and dialogue and discussion happens. Um, of course, there's sometimes going to be sort of the negative side of that, or you might be at the, the receiving end of some negative criticism. But as Dan said, you know making sure that your voice is heard, whatever your opinion is, even if it's counter to, you know, what the majority of people are thinking. Um, and, and that is a way that, you know, understanding and dialogue can start to happen. Um, so I think, yeah, just really thinking about media as a meeting place in a way can maybe help in terms of navigating some of those issues. Yeah, just, I mean, to sort of reiterate what I said, but I hopefully make it a little clearer. Like, I think uh, I'm just often surprised how often government uh, just doesn't respond to things, um, and I, I I can't imagine why it's in their interest to like just not give some kind of an answer or make somebody available. I mean, I guess it's a, I don't know maybe they, maybe they know what they're doing better than I do, but I just think if you um, if you make yourself available to the media and you're willing and you're willing to have somebody talk, I think it might help uh, the tone of the coverage. It might help. Because uh, just so often, like, we have these stories and there's just no government voice in there, or it says no one from the ministry of blah, blah, blah was available to talk, or it says questions that were posed were not returned on time. So um, I don't know, there's not, nothing else we can do in our role. If, if there's no answer, there's no answer, then you only have the voice of all these people that are, let's say in theory it's a story that's critical of some local government. If the, if the local government doesn't want to talk, then you're only going to have the people who are critical of it. And you, you go looking for somebody on the other side, and if they don't want to talk, you can't make them. So it's, a cha it's frustrating for us. A lot of times we wish people would talk to us. But, yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, Laura and Dan, for that. Um, so we've got a few minutes here. So if anyone has any more questions they'd like to ask, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but our last one right now is from Rachel Fan of Water Canada. 
So she's asking, um, trade publications often preach to the choir because our readers are always aware of the issues already. Uh, so what are some ways we might successfully engage with the general public who might not be as knowledgeable about the topic or inclined to pick up on such a niche magazine? It's a, yeah, it's a difficult question, Rachel, because I mean, inherently, you're sort of branding and you're a trade magazine that has certain sort of, you know, meaning and, and audience attached to it. Um, I guess, yeah, this could be a much bigger conversation. Um, I guess I would be curious sort of who, who you're wanting to broaden to, like general audience is, is quite broad, um, like are there specific sort of, you know, sectors or, or individuals or organizations that you're wanting to reach? Because then you can start to get creative and brainstorm about, you know, what might be the most effective ways to reach them. Another thought, I, I don't know how this would work with sort of your, your agreements or, um, you know, if people are writing stories for you getting paid, I don't know, but maybe some of your content, which is, you know, very quality, um, could be adapted into things like an op-ed or, you know, to be turned into a story that could maybe run in a publication that is designed for more sort of broad uptake. I don't know if that's even feasible, but um, when you have content, you know, I always try to think about how can we sort of get this out there in as many ways as possible. Or I mean, coming back to the whole YouTube thing, the number of hours people are spending, you know, can you make some sort of like video story that might um, have more public appeal um, on some of the topics that you're covering? Um, this is, yeah, this sort of, to my mind, gets to the brainstorming piece and it just becomes a general communications question and there's like so many options um, that it actually can get really fun. <laughs> I don't know what you think, Dan. Um, yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, as Laura says, it depends on sort of what kind of audience you want to reach. And uh, I think, yeah, if you've got a story that you think could interest a bigger audience, um, I, I don't know, I mean, I would, I would, I would welcome uh, people from specialty sort of tr niche trade publications to get in touch with me about possible story ideas and stuff. And it could even be, like, sometimes... Uh, we do because we do read through trade publications, and sometimes, you know, a lot of times it's stuff that's only interesting that to that niche audience. And then sometimes we find something, and maybe it was reported months ago, it to this one sort of niche audience that it's common knowledge among this audience. But we say, whoa, this is kind of interesting to the general public, and people don't know about this, and this would be surprising. And so sometimes we do dig up stories, and sometimes they're months old, but they can they still have relevance or whatever. Um, so I actually, I mean, I never really get pitches from people at trade publications, but I would really welcome it um, if they, yeah, again, if, if they wanted to get their story out there. And I have tried contacting specialty publications once or twice. I remember phoning up, like, Canadian Grocer Magazine because I was doing a story about grocery stores. And unfortunately, I didn't end up using the guy in the story, but he was very, very helpful and put me on to other people. But I was talking to the editor of Canadian Grocer Magazine, which I didn't know existed before, but I was doing a story about groceries and... Um, he was very, very helpful. I would, yeah, I would really welcome, um, for me personally, and I, I can't speak for other journalists, but I imagine they would, if you've got something that you think would be interesting. And I guess the key thing is to think about, like, not every story in a niche publication, not every story in your trade magazine is going to be interesting to a broader audience. Um, by definition, I mean, that's what you're doing. But some of those stories probably will be, or elements of them. But you might have to sort of reframe it in a different way. And you think about, don't think about what's the biggest topic of discussion when you're in a, a one of these kind of webinars or when you're at the Canadian Water Summit, like it's not necessarily about what's the biggest story there, but what is it when you're talking with your mom in the car and you mention something to her, what gets her, what gets her interested? Or if you're talking with your buddies at the bar, and you're having a beer and you tell them something and they have nothing to do with water or water legislation or the environment, if there's something you tell them that they say, what, really? That's kind of crazy. Those kinds of stories, especially if they can be you know, broken down into a pretty concise one or two sentence kind of thing. Hey, did you know that this, 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 what, really? Those, those can be good fodder for a mass audience story and feel free to sort of get in touch with bigger media, I would say. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so, I'm not seeing any more questions in our chat box. Um, I'll hand it over to Laura and Dan. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to add before we do a wrap? 
Oh, just a final thank you from me. Um, yeah, I appreciate everybody who took the time to come out and yeah, your questions as well. I think this has been really good and, and I hope that sort of our overarching goal of, you know, empowering and, and you know, creating a bit more, making a bit more noise um, in the media around particularly some of these um, important topics. Um, environmental issues and the Water Sustainability Act. I hope that, yeah, we can sort of all do that together. Yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks for having Great. me. Okay, I'll do my wrap here. Um, so thanks, Laura and Dan. I thought it was a really great presentation. Thanks for your expertise shared on your presentations and in question period. And thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar. Uh, we record all of our webinars and house them on our YouTube channel, and the link to our YouTube channel is right there on the slide. You can view all of our archived webinars there, and I'll be circulating the link to this webinar once it's posted online, and that'll likely be in the next couple weeks. Uh, as some of you know, we are maybe aware, we usually do five webinars for each Creating a Blue Dialogue season, and as I mentioned in my introduction, this is the final webinar in our fifth season. And our sixth season will resume after the summer, so we'll be in touch in the next couple months with the details of that. And just a final reminder, so as I mentioned earlier, the Canadian Freshwater Alliance is hosting a complimentary session to today's webinar, which will be held on July 28th. And this webinar is intended as a skills building session for nonprofit and First Nation groups. And registration information is provided on this slide. So if you're interested, that's there for you. And yeah, I think take care, everyone. I think that's it from us. Hope you enjoyed today's discussion. And you'll hear from myself or Laura Brandis with some follow-up resources in the next few weeks. So thank you. Great. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.